I'm excited for our next talk moving forward, which is titled Accelerating Information Extraction with Data-Centric Iteration. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, back again, Director of Product and Founding Engineer at Snorkel AI, Vincent Chen, along with the Tech Lead Manager on the Applied Machine Learning Team at Snorkel AI, John Simergian. Welcome, John. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'll hand the stage over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, oh, there's Vincent. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, folks, if you're uh, here from the previous session, hello again. <laughs> um, super excited to be joined for a, a session here with uh, John, where we'll be talking a little bit about a different application in Snorkel Flow around information extraction. And over the years, again, we've worked with a bunch of organizations who have driven really exciting business value from IE or information extraction apps. And we've also seen how these types of problems can be really fundamentally challenging from an ML perspective for a lot of organizations. We're really excited to share our view, working with customers in the field uh, about the highest leverage ways that enterprises can accelerate their workflows with these data-centric iteration practices. So a sketch of what we'll be talking about today. Um, we'll start with a thousand foot view about how we've seen IE applications play a role with our customers. And then we'll dive a level deeper into the technical challenges that we see organizations face. Finally, I'll pass it to John for a series of walkthroughs in Snorkel Flow to describe how data-centric iteration can actually help you overcome these challenges in practice and make them a little bit more real for you if you were day-to-day -day trying to solve these really complex problems as a data scientist or practitioner. So let's jump in. I'll start by framing what we mean when we talk about information extraction and try to connect it to some of the problems that we've seen enterprises try to solve. You know, in practice, we've worked with a range of customers with a high level goal of translating their specific enterprise data and knowledge into domain specific AI. We see our users try to build a wide range of ML tasks to drive, again, applications that are specific to their data, specific to their tasks. And information extraction is one of the most popular use cases that we see simply because of the types of impacts and automation and insights that they can drive in a downstream way. In broad strokes, this is a bit of a sketch or a recipe of how we see a lot of IE systems actually drive impact in our enterprise customers. To start, there's a ton of really rich and valuable unstructured data that a lot of these organizations have access to. And the goal is to actually structure the outputs of these, these uh, sets of unstructured data um, into a set of you know, closed schema outputs that um, can then be used for some sort of downstream analysis or application. So for instance, consider this example where um, you know, this is actually inspired by some of our, our uh, customers in the financial services industry, where you're trying to structure risk factors from unstructured company 10K filings. You can imagine that when you start with 10K documents, these come in a range of bespoke formats and content. The format changes per company. Every company decides to talk about something a little bit different. And the goal might be to pull out and structure the different risk factors associated with these SEC filings um, that are specific to an organization's internal risk management guidelines or investment specifications, right? These are specific to a team's goals and objectives, and they wanna build a custom information extraction pipeline to pull out information in a format that works for them they can use for some downstream application. This is where we see Snorkel come in. We're able to help drive a really efficient process in building an AI model and system to actually pull out and structure a, a bunch of this information. And this is the kind of IE pipeline that we see a lot of our customers really excited to build and accelerate because in practice, it can be really challenging to get these systems up and running in a practical, robust, and maintainable way. Finally, using those structured outputs, there's actually a whole range of applications that we see enterprises try to build that end up driving a ton of business value. These could be dashboards of trends over time. Some organizations try to accelerate document analysis with you know, faceted search applications. Um, others try to set up risk alerting or monitoring systems. You can imagine alerting on different types of risks in SEC filings if you're an investment team. These types of powerful downstream applications built on top of these information extraction systems end up being really, really important to, again, 
unlocking entirely new products or accelerating existing initiatives or reducing costs in ways that um, really make a difference for organizations and enterprises that we work with. So diving a level deeper, what are the, some of the technical challenges that we've been alluding to that block this kind of really valuable information extraction system in practice? In broad strokes, as an overview, AI is blocked on the data. You know, we're finding that models and infrastructure are increasingly commoditizing. And to us, that's actually very exciting. It means that the latest state-of-the-art models are more powerful, more push-button, more standard than ever. And they're just becoming more accessible for practitioners and data scientists that we work with. That means that many industry-grade solutions, a lot of these models are actually available with the click of a button in open source formats, which is really, really exciting and, and uh, a great step forward for the community. The biggest problem that we see for a lot of organizations is the data, right? In practice, organization-specific training data that ML models learn from, it's scarce, it's hard to structure, and it's, it's, it's challenging to curate and develop in a way that can be actually scalable for ML model development. So training sets end up being the key to success or failure in a lot of ML today. And especially in these information extraction settings, we see the data as the key blocker to shipping production grade ML that's robust and maintainable in the long term. Now I'll note that this continues to be true even with the acceleration of foundation models and large language models. In these settings, we have a much stronger first mile, right? That's provided by these foundation models. But that's exactly what we, we, we see them as. They're the foundation for more advanced, more domain-specific problems to be built on top of. In practice, these models can't really deliver the last mile accuracy that we find as critical to making a model get to production. And we've seen that some amount of adaptation or data development is necessary to close that gap and, again, take these systems to production in a robust and accurate way. So at the end of the day, we found that the only effective and viable interface to building AI systems is the data. This is the process of adapting generic models to your specific use case or domain using labels, prompts, other sources of knowledge. And this approach of iteratively developing data to improve model performance is what we call data-centric AI. So now that we've framed a little bit of this high-level approach, in the next few slides, I'll share a few of the specific ways that we see data scientists and machine learning AI practitioners get stuck when building these AI systems. And the challenges I'll outline are threefold. It starts with inefficient manual labeling. It, it you know, proceeds into the fact that a lot of organizations have these noisy and stale legacy systems that are hard to leverage and hard to reuse and update. And finally, we'll talk about how for span extraction problems specifically, error modes can be really complex and nuanced and with traditional approaches, it can be really challenging to actually correct the types of errors that you'll see in these types of systems. So to start with manual labeling, we see that you know, in traditional ML problems, this is the go-to way to get your data labeled, but the process can be really slow and is often reliant on experts whose time is really, really valuable. Think legal experts, doctors, healthcare, healthcare professionals, folks who Again, if they're spending time manually highlighting and dragging, you know, dragging highlights and text, that can be a really low leverage way to, to uh, use someone's time with all that expertise. This process is often really manual, right? Which means that a lot of the auditability and adaptability that's critical to our organizations is essentially a non-starter. And again, in these information extraction systems, that click to drag, highlight to label type of interface ends up being quite slow and quite error prone for a lot of organizations. And again, often ends up being a bit of a, a cold start, right? A, a key blocker to even getting started with AI development in the first place. The next challenge I want to paint a bit is around noisy and legacy, noisy and stale legacy systems. We often encounter teams that have a number of existing systems in place for information extraction, and the key question we hear is, is there a way to update these systems, to re-leverage or repurpose them for newer tasks, newer, sch new, newer schemas? And the teams we work with end up with a bit, bit of a sunk cost dilemma, right? These are static rules and ontologies and models that quickly become stale, and they come with varying degrees of quality, right? It can be often really challenging to leverage and reconcile the outputs of these systems. And 
we, we hear time and time again that organizations really struggle to make use of what's actually a really rich goldmine of um, you know, information and knowledge and existing, existing systems that they've built over the years. We hear that there's a desire to leverage these and update these, but there isn't really a path to do so um, to build you know, more modern and, and automated um, IE systems in practice. Finally, it can be really hard to actually correct errors of these information extraction systems. You know, take this example that I have up on the slide where the goal is to pull out named entity mentions from text from uh, financial news reports, right? For an application like this, NER can be a pretty standard machine learning problem, but you could actually see in practice a whole different set of errors that comes out, you know, when you're actually building the model. You might see false negatives, false positives, boundary errors, right? You might get a partial match on some of the entities that are extracted. And in some cases, you might actually get the right entity extracted, but the wrong classification on top of it. Each of these error modes actually requires very different treatment when it comes to remediation. And for a lot of teams who don't have the right tools or interfaces or workflows to address these, it can be actually quite overwhelming and can feel like, again, a bit of a whack-a-mole process to drive down these types of errors. So let me flip it over to John now to talk about how we address these issues in snorkel flow specifically using our data centric iteration paradigm and hopefully some of these ideas and pain points that you may have experienced yourself become a little bit more real and you see a path to what it what we mean when we say data centric development. So John over over to you. Thanks Vincent. Awesome. Hi everyone. So today we're going to go over couple of different workflows in snorkel flow, uh, starting with the first one, which is uh, you know, the difference between programmatic labeling and manual labeling. So here we can see an example of an application for information extraction, where the goal is to extract mentions of company names from news articles. So a binary classification problem. And uh, you might be wondering why we want to build a model for this anyway, since you know, company names are you know, maybe contain some lexicon or ontology somewhere. But you know, new startups and companies are, are, are coming up every day. And so you want to be able to capture that in this problem. Um, and so the most the first thing you would do in like a traditional NER information extraction problem is annotate data, which is what we're doing right now in Snorkel Flow. Uh, you know, annotating two spans uh, for the company uh, class. Um, and then, you know, you would expect to do this for thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of documents, depending on what kind of performance you're looking for. So this takes time, it's slow, expensive, and error prone. Um, and so the alternative is to use a data centric approach uh, via programmatic labeling. So here I can observe a couple of things. I see in these two examples that the first letter starts with a capital letter, uh, followed by a, a space potentially, or an optional lowercase letter and then ending in with also like an optional incorporator or limited uh, suffix at the end. So I can create a, a somewhat imperfect regular expression um, using this very simple labeling function builder uh, for using uh, as a regex. So once you now this gets inputted, I'll be able to compute a couple of different metrics to evaluate the quality of this individual labeling function. And there are really two that are the most important. Uh, which we'll see in a moment. Uh, the first is precision. So precision in this case is essentially just for every single token uh, that this labeling function votes on, how many of those were correct? And we wanna keep that as high as possible, but it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, and we can also see how many spans are actually being uh, captured by this sure 16, we get 98% precision in coverage, which is another important metric here. It's essentially, the total of the total number of tokens in the document, how many does this vote on individually? So this can remain low, it doesn't have to be high individually, but over time with all the labeling functions you've written, you wanna get that as high as possible. And you can see already given the 10 labeling functions in this left side in this column here in this table, you can see we have almost 800 snorkel flow programmatically generated labels, which get roughly 7.6% coverage across the entire dev set. So I'm gonna go ahead and create this labeling function and add this to the list of 10 that I already have. And then once that completes, I'll be able to see my LF coverage numbers go up and the number of snorkel flow generator uh, generated labels to increase as well. So this is just a great way of, of immediately getting additional uh, feedback uh, and ground truth or uh, programmatic labels in your data to increase the quality of the end model that you eventually train. 
Now, the next workflow is then uh, leveraging some of the external and internal resources you might have uh, that your organization already you know, uh, contains. So the first to maybe you might want to consider is using an internal lexicon ontology that another team or your team has curated or a set of embeddings that your team has maybe developed uh, and trained internal on your proprietary data. Um, another is foundation tools. Uh, in this example, we're going to take a look at a labeling function that uses a, uh, a mapping between Fortune 500 company ticker symbols and uh, and some uh, different variations of the spelling of that company. So this is something that we pulled from the web, very simple, and we're immediately to plug it into this uh, UI-based labeling function. No coding required whatsoever. Um, and we've obviously sent, assigned the, the company class name for these problems. In yellow, you can see what the labeling function is voting on. Uh, and here I've also brought up uh, kind of just to, to show you a snapshot of what that JSON looks like that, we, that powers this labeling function uh, behind the scenes. So very simple. The purple is the ground truth uh, you can see in, uh, in the data viewer. Another example uh, of leveraging these internal taxonomies or lexicons is via code. Uh, you, you can leverage uh, Snorkel's uh, Python SDK to take advantage of that, create a regular expression on the fly using this ontology. And you see we get pretty good precision at 97% and, and reasonable coverage for this individual LF. Again, minimal effort, uh, and it's just a pattern base, very simple uh, regular expression that you can generate dynamically. So entirely code based via uh, Snorkel's Python SDK. Um, I also mentioned embeddings too. So embeddings are a really powerful way of getting some great coverage across uh, uh, the labels in your data set. And in Snorkel, we have the ability to actually automatically recommend those embedding based labeling functions. Uh, here we can see two examples of suggested labeling functions. Uh, this one, how it works behind the scenes is it actually uses Spacey's part of speech tagger to identify span chunks or noun chunks from the text. The next step is to embed those noun chunks, you know, using whatever embedding you have. It could be from Spacey, it could be you know, from BERT, whatever, it doesn't matter. Next, we train a binary classifier on top of that. Um, and we're able to get two labeling functions out of this from a single model. You know, this gets almost 90% precision and, and very good coverage for a single LF. So this is a great LF that you know, we should consider adding to improve the quality uh, of our training labels and also improve coverage and, and the number of programmatically generated labels. And here we can see for the other model uh, uh, you know, in yellow, what it's actually highlighting. So these are all being identified as proper nouns, either correctly or incorrectly by Spacey. And we're agnostic to that. As long as the labeling function itself is able to get good precision, we can take advantage of even noisy behind the scenes pre-processing techniques. Uh, so in this case, the data is well formatted, so I would expect that Spacey would do quite well. And, last, and the last workflow here is basically to be able to build a model on top of these labels that you've used uh, via Snorkel's uh, label model. So I've already trained a model here. Um, this is an N model, very simple model, and I can see a confusion matrix on the left side of the screen. Uh, this confusion matrix is telling me one important thing, which is that the lower left quadrant needs some help. It's also telling me when I look at LF coverage, that coverage is pretty low. We generally want to get this as high as possible. And as a rule of thumb, I personally like to get it at around 40 to 50% before I feel like I have enough confidence that the model is going to do really well on unseen data. But here uh, we can see that the area we want to focus on is instances where we're predicting the other class, but the ground truth is company. So when I click on this cell, Snorkel will automatically generate a filter over my data using the model predictions and the ground truth. So here we can see the dotted lines, which represent the model predictions. In this case, they represent the other class. The purple is the ground truth for company. So this is how the filter uh, is applied also visually, in addition to filtering the data itself. So we're going to take a look at an example of some documents. And we can see very quickly that the model is not doing well in those documents. For the vast majority of tokens here, it's predicting the other class. So we know we need to add more signal for the company class. Um, we can see, you know, we see two examples of Rolls Royce and Boeing. So maybe we can actually take another kind of deeper dive and see if there are any existing labeling functions that are voting on these. So I'm going to select the first ground truth span here and take a look and sort the labeling functions and see if there's anything that's voting on it. So it looks like for the first two, I see nothing. For Boeing, I can see the blue check marks on the left labeling function table. And notice that there are two LFs that are voting on it. In this next example, we can see for NVIDIA, uh, nothing is coming up uh, for these examples across the LF. So I need to write a, a labeling function for the, uh, 
company class. Um, so I think going back to our original embedding based labeling function, since it had such good coverage, might be a great way of actually being able to capture those. So when I click on that labeling function, I add a yet another uh, filter, which is whether this labeling function voted on these documents, which I can see in yellow. So we're picking up Rolls Royce and NVIDIA. So I'm going to accept that labeling function. And I'm also going to do the same thing for the other class, even though I didn't really have to. That's not what the error bucket was for, but it's there. It's getting high precision. So might as well just accept it and get some additional uh, coverage. So coverage went up over 10% now, which is great, just from two LFs. And I've already generated hundreds more programmatically generated labels for free. Now I'm going to train an N model. In this case, we'll just use a simple distilled model, nothing too crazy. We'll also train a, a label model behind the scenes, which is what powers the N model. And I'm just going to set all the parameters, the default parameters for this model, and train a model rather quickly. So instead of training a bigger you know, model with you know, billions of parameters, I want to get feedback right away. I don't want to wait. So we can track model progress here in Circle Flow. And hopefully, you know, after uh, just a short while, I can get back results from my uh, from this distilled BERT model. And I can see in the confusion matrix in the lower left quadrant that there are far fewer mistakes that the, that the model is making. Uh, for instances where we're predicting other, uh, but where the ground truth is company. So I've you know, gotten a huge lift there on the modeling side just by adding a few different labeling functions. Um, I also want to see how I'm doing compared to our valid set, which is some small set of manually labeled data that I haven't looked at. I can see dev is doing a, a, a bit better than valid, so we might want to focus on that later. Um, I can also see versus you know, the original model I trained, I'm doing much better as far as span F1 is concerned, which is the the metric of choice here, but that can obviously be changed. Um, so this is just a, a great way uh, to be able to use our model analysis tools to interrogate the data, understand what mistakes we're making, and what to do next. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Vincent. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Um, I'll quickly wrap us up here by talking about the types of problems we talked about today and uh, some of the opportunities to addressing them using data-centric AI. We talked about the bottlenecks of inefficient manual labeling, and John showed us a demo describing how users can programmatically label their data sets, a critical step to actually scaling and automating training set creation. Next slide, please. And then we talked about you know, how noisy and legacy systems can be a bit of a challenge to integrate or update over time and how uh, we can use labeling functions as a bit of a wrapper to pull in those existing systems and leverage weak supervision to denoise them. So, you know, that sunk cost fallacy becomes less of a problem in snorkel flow because you can actually leverage those existing systems to jumpstart and bootstrap your development process. Third, we talked about the challenges of complex error cases in information extraction settings. And John, again, showed a few of the powerful analysis tools in Snorkel Flow where you can focus on hotspots where there are certain types of errors, build some intuition for what's actually causing the error. Is it a formatting issue? Is it a labeling issue? What, what's the nature of the error that you're seeing? And actually be guided to providing additional corrective supervision to address that long tail of issues. So again, thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to hear more from you all about how you build information extraction in practice. And it's been a pleasure to share how, again, in practice, a lot of these challenging AI systems uh, can, can you know, be quite daunting to build for a lot of our customers. And uh, hopefully you've seen a little bit of a peek of how these data-centric techniques can uh, accelerate your development process. Thanks again. Thank you so much, John and Vincent. It was great to see both the high level themes as well as some really specific workflows for these information extraction problems. Our first question here is about those analysis tools that John was showing us. Um, the question is, how well do those tools, um, how shareable are they across information extraction problems from different domains? Yeah, John, do you want to take a stab at this one? Um, sure. Um, I mean, they are universal tools, so that it's not just you know for a domain specific problem. They can be applied across many different industries, many different types of data sets. And in fact, those tools are standardized across all of Snorkel's uh, application templates. So 
whether it's a classification or using some type card problem or PDF extraction, images, information extraction in several different ways, tabular data, they're all the same. And that's because they really, uh, they're fundamental to all of machine learning and uh, they're extremely powerful tools and they're gonna be useful across all different domains. I have experience working with customers in, in banking and finance and insurance, and they've all been huge fans of our error analysis tools and all of use completely different data sets. So they're, they're universal. Thank you. The next question is where do practitioners spend most of their time when they're getting started on a net new problem? Yeah, I'm happy to take this one. What we find in practice is that a lot of teams spend an inordinate amount of time just labeling initial data manually. Um, this can be a really painstaking process, as John showed, especially for these IE problems where you're trying to do character or span level analysis. And um, yeah, it, it's it's in some cases actually just a non-starter, right? Uh, you just often don't get enough label data to start to even build a meaningful model in a lot of these cases. So that's definitely the number one place where I think we see organizations really struggle to get started or manage costs or just just the overhead of manual labeling. Um, and you know, thankfully, with with systems like Snorkel, we've seen a significant increase in usability and efficiency at that step exactly. The programmatic labeling does definitely help with that manual labeling bottleneck. Um, there's been a lot of talk throughout this conference about foundation models. Um, are these problems problems that can be solved out of the box with foundation models? Yeah, I'm happy to take a stab at this one too. I mean, the the point of view we have on foundation models, and we have some empirical results here as well, is that you know they're really great generalists, right? So if you're working on web data, say Twitter data or Reddit data, you know, common distributions that are on the web, um, they might do pretty well. In other cases, right, if you actually have a system that doesn't need extremely high, you know, accuracy requirements, right, you can sometimes get by with, with just using a foundation model out of the box. What we find in practice, though, is that a lot of enterprises actually have domain-specific problems, specific tasks, specific data sets that they need these models to work over. And while they provide a really strong starting point, it doesn't quite close that last mile to making them production ready. So for a lot of these enterprise use cases, um, we see them as a really exciting trend to start you know, providing a, a higher floor, if you will, right? A, a great foundation to build on top of. But that last mile development, that adaptation is still quite critical to putting these types of models into production. That makes sense. Okay, and uh, one last question here. What is most challenging with information extraction problems, uh, particularly with this data-centric approach? John, you wanna take this one? I know you've worked on a few recently. <laughs> sure. Um, I would say, I mean, I can think of a few and I'll, and I'll try to list them. So one is being able to articulate a labeling function just you know like for the the negative class so snorkel requires uh to write labeling functions for all of the classes so sometimes this is kind of it can be somewhat awkward because you're used to thinking about the positive classes right like we want to classify movie reviews and the genres of movies or something like that you know you can think of what a, a romance you know film would be about or a horror film but like thinking about what is not that um you know and when you're doing an extraction problem it can be sometimes awkward. Uh, and so Snorkel's auto-suggest functionality is really key when it comes to that, because that is using only whatever kind of supervised and like minimal amount of grand truth data level you have um, to actually learn and give you empirically good suggestions. So we really recommend folks take advantage kind of of Snorkel's auto-suggest functionality when it comes to that. And also just to think more creatively, you know, whether you're using part of speech tags or uh, you know, looking at casing or kind of word morphology when you think about those problems. Um, it just takes a little bit of creativity and thinking outside the box to really get that nailed down. Um, the other problem I would say is just, uh, you know, kind of more general, not to just information extraction, but to any kind of classification problem, which is thinking about uh, what do the classes mean? You know, this sometimes can be really confusing uh, when label distributions might overlap. Um, and, you know, you have to really think of the nuances of what classifies, uh, what determines the, the label schema for one class or another and how similar are they? So thinking about your label schema 
very carefully when you're architecting the uh, the application uh, to, to start with is reasonably important and will kind of improve uh, the quality of the results you'll get in the end. That makes sense. It's clear you have a lot of experience thinking through these problems. So thank you for sharing that experience with us today. Thank you both Vincent and John for that great presentation. Thanks, Rebecca. Appreciate it. Thank you.